I could already feel a few beads of sweat running down from my forehead. It was already such a hot day and the sun had just barely crested the horizon. From the get-go, I had a feeling it was going to be a particularly hot season and I was going to be busy. Opening the front door to my small living quarters, I threw some of my gear and supplies down. Shifting everything around, I made sure to go over my list. If anything was missing, now was the only good time to take care of it. Luckily, my list was completed with several check marks, and I closed the door to the cabin and headed toward the tower. It always feels like returning to a second home when I walk up the steps. Like greeting an old friend when I open up the door to the lookout and feel the wall of stale air that had been waiting for me since I left. The rising sun pushed through the lookout's window and I could see the sunlight resting on swirling dust particles. I could see the movement of air caused by the opening of the door and the way the dust retreated. Walking in, I got the first glimpse of my favorite view. The seemingly endless waves of dark green the tower overlooked. Sun rising above the treetops rushing through the canopy. Somehow, always gets me feeling emotional. Better yet, were the heavy dark clouds I see rolling in from the distance. The beautiful rising sun and a thunderstorm were a great way to start the season. Before those clouds reached me though, I needed to do some handiwork. I made sure all the instruments were ready to go, wiping a layer of dust off the maps, making sure the Alidade was moving alright. It can get a little stiff when unattended. Clicking down, I heard a soft buzz coming from a two-way radio. I placed batteries next to it so I wouldn't have to go searching for them if it ran out. Exiting the tower, I descended and submerged myself within the trees. I always like to collect firewood as soon as I can. The more I can get, the longer I can go without doing it again. The longer I can just relax. It took a while, but I was eventually happy with the stock I had acquired making sure to put it where the upcoming storm wouldn't dampen it. After throwing the pile together, I went back up into the tower and started my ever-vigilant watch over the forest. With the storm coming, it felt like the conditions were right for potential fires to spring up, so I needed to keep an eye out. Sure enough, it wasn't long before a thin trail of smoke rose from the pasture of green. There are a lot more fires than you'd expect during peak season. A lot of the time, a big one will make it to the news. Maybe a few more. There are on average about 70,000 wildfires each year. Thanks to people like me, a good portion of them are stopped before they can become that sweeping wall of fire you see on the news. Getting to the Alidade, I moved the finder until the crosshairs rested over the emerging stack of smoke invading the skyline. I noted the position on the map and radioed to the nearest towers to triangulate the fire's position. After that, I did all I could and watched. I kept looking around to make sure there wasn't any spotting. None occurred, but the original smokestack seemed to grow unusually fast. I figured the weather helped it spread, but it almost looked like a deliberate burn. I worried that within my first day there was going to be a catastrophe on my watch. Fire services didn't want to deploy a plane as the storm was approaching, but when the smoke became too intense they must have decided to take the risk. I watched a wall of water falling from above drenching trees. For a moment, it truly looked like an ocean. As the water fell the smoke was snuffed out save for a few smaller patches that were out soon after by people on the ground. I was honestly surprised with how swiftly it was contained and put out. Normally, it's such a back and forth dance to mitigate damage, but it was contained and put out. It was pretty much done and gone before I had the chance to open a can of beans. The rest of the hours with sunlight were uneventful. A small fire was put out faster than the last as it was much easier to access. After a few hours had passed, the dark clouds were no longer a distant vision and had blotted out the blue sky above. I could see rolling lines of light shooting from one end of the sky to the other. It was going to be a heavy one. Normally at night, I would climb down to the cabin and sleep there, but it's hard to pass up a good thunderstorm. I heard the distant mumbling of far-off lightning strikes, just waiting for the darkness around me to reveal its shade of purple. 
The tops of trees moved like fields of grain as the wind played with the canopy. The rain started falling from the clouds. At first light a drizzle that quickly chorused into a heavy downpour. The sizable orbs of water smacking to the roof above my head. Standing up, I walked to the window peering out at an expansive view. As I looked out into the trees, I couldn't help but notice that a section of the trees was behaving weirdly. It was subtle, but the tops of the trees were swaying, even between the gusts of wind, moving sporadically. I leaned in to get a closer look, struggling to see clearly beyond the littering of raindrops hanging onto the window. Briefly, I could see what looked like lights. They were faint and disappeared so quickly I thought I was seeing things. Narrowing my eyes, I tried to get another view, and as I did, the sky around me lit up a bright purple. It was like God had taken a picture with the flash on, my vision becoming momentarily impaired. Shortly after, I could feel the tower vibrating as a wave of thunder crashed into it from above. As the thunder invaded my ears, it was the only thing I could hear. The wind and drops of rain falling under an audible level, it was enough to make my skull rattle. And as I tried to return my senses to stability, I saw the faint light again. I couldn't tell if it was closer or just getting brighter. Again though, like a wisp of smoke, it vanished as soon as it appeared. My main concern was that some hiker had somehow gotten themselves lost and stuck in the storm that the light I was seeing was their flashlight failing them. I didn't know how someone would have made it out this far. It would make sense that the light would be getting closer to me if someone was lost. The tower would be easy to see against the dark sky. Deciding to brave the storm myself, I opened the door and stepped out onto the walkway, making sure to minimize my contact with metal. The rain pelted against my skin as I neared the edge of the tower, peering into the trees. I watched treetops dance, trying to make out any sign of life, like I was staring at a magic picture. I tried to yell out, but I could only tell my voice was quickly being snuffed out by the raging storm. The light appeared once more. With a better view of it, I thought it looked more like a lantern than it did a flashlight. The source seemed to be more natural. There was no way of knowing what shape the person was in, so I decided to go meet them and try to help. Walking down the steps during a thunderstorm is unadvisable, but I was dealing with an extraordinary circumstance. Trying my best to avoid touching metal, I methodically made my way down the steps that had been covered in rainwater. Each step was incredibly perilous. Finally reaching the bottom and feeling my boots sink into the soft mud, I ran over to where I saw the light. I could just barely make it out through the trees and falling rain. A small beacon of light approaching slowly, my efforts to call out to it still pressured by the wind and rain. It was getting fairly close though, soon to break the tree line surrounding the lookout, so I started walking towards it. As I started walking away from the lookout, an intense strike of lightning got to the ground nearby. Again, my vision went blank as the light purple shuttered my eyes. You know how when you stare at something for a while and you close your eyes and you see like an outline of it in the darkness? It was like that. When the bright lightning dissipated my world went dark again, but I was able to see an outline of what was in front of me. It was like a snapshot plaguing my vision. I couldn't make out much while the snapshot was there. The trees reaching high were most of it, but I saw enough. Enough to know whatever approaching the tower was not a person. As the intense boom of thunder rang out, I could feel my feet retreating before my head even had the time to process what I was seeing. My fight or flight response was kicking in naturally. Closing the gate behind me, I started ascending the steps again, absent mind and gripping onto the metal. Thankfully, the lightning strikes only inhabited the forest for the time being. I lost my footing on one of the steps and crashed down. My knee was the first to make contact, striking hard against the firm step. My grunt nearly filled my mouth with water. Through the gaps in the stairs, I could see the light. Now a pair hanging side by side, breaking through the trees. It was low, almost skittering against the ground as it was reaching out of the trees, 
feeling the ground before it advanced. With a heave, I pulled myself up to my feet, doing the best I could to ignore the pain in my knee. Without looking down, I continued up until I made it to the top of the lookout tower. Feeling an aching in my knee, I hobbled over to the radio, clinking it down. I attempted to reach out. All I got in return was heavy static. The air was full of static with such a mean storm overhead, there was no way I was getting through to anybody. Walking out into the storm, I looked down at the creature that had made it to the fence that represented my only real defense. It wrapped its thin and wiry fingers around the chain link and pulled at it. Lacking an understanding of what was in its way, the thing backed up and then looked up to the source of light, which in turn was me. Its bulbous eyes had faint amber glows to them, like it was a source of light guiding it through the dark forest. A distant stroke of lightning caused enough light to reveal the thing's small and low frame. It crawled on all fours but appeared humanoid. We locked eyes for a moment, the rain running off its slick skin. It tilted its head while looking at me. The thing's mouth opened and it let out a whine. I don't know how it was able to produce a noise that overpowered the storm. It rang out. The high-pitched cry piercing my ears. I could hear it bubbling as the rain got into its throat. Going back into the lookout, I shuffled things around. Though, I knew all I had was a flare gun. Leaving it on the table, I started heading to the window when I got a good look at the forest around me. The whine the creature gave off running across the land slipping through the trees calling for others. As such, I could see in the distance, through the canopy, dozens of lights appearing in the distance, like a horde of will-o'-wisp. They started moving towards the tower, with a flashlight in hand. I went to the one sitting outside the fence and shined the beam onto it for a better look. Pale. A nearly translucent skin that revealed thin trails of red veins underneath. Many veins stemmed like tree trunks leading to the thing's eyes. All of its blood seemed to concentrate there. I could see its hands. Nails glistened in the light. They looked small but sharp. I was surprised the thing wasn't just ripping through the fence. Teeth clattered, almost as sharp looking as the nails. The thing looked like something I would expect to see at the bottom of the ocean. I started moving away, taking the flashlight off of it. I saw its head follow the beam of light, almost like a cat. I tried it a few more times, moving it back and forth. Then, with the flashlight off, its attention shifted immediately back to the tower. Quickly, I went inside and started turning out any light source. With the night sky and the heavy clouds, I could barely see my way around. I looked around me. The forest looked like it was made of blades of grass, lights like fireflies moving through the field. They were closing in. I had forgotten about the lights at the bottom of the tower. Another trip down the stairs had my heart racing. I knew how close I was going to have to get to this thing, nearly face to face. My boot returned to the soil and I made my way over to the light, strung up around the fence. Something I had put there a few shifts ago to help myself if I ever went on late night walks. I was following the light with my eyes to find the power cord, until I realized it was plugged into my cabin. Grabbing the white wire, I tried to pull back on it and tried to unplug it from a distance, but I couldn't get a good grip as it was slicked from the rain. I even tried to wrap it around my fist, but it just wouldn't budge. I didn't even have a knife in the lookout to cut the wire with. Things like that were all in the cabin if I needed them. I went to the gate and sat the flashlight down, having it shine the light away from the cabin. After a few short breaths attempting to hype myself up, I pushed the gate open and sprinted towards the cabin. The ground was soaked with rain and I could feel my feet trying to sweep out from under me but I continued. Rushing into the cabin and swinging the door shut, I flicked the light switch and looked for the cord. Finding it quickly, I pulled the plug and looked out the small window to see the white lights flicked off. Letting out a breath, all I need to do was get back to the lookout. We're creatures of habit though. I hadn't even realized I turned the cabin's light on. It's something I've done a hundred times. I didn't even think about it. Muscle memory just took over as I entered. I had a plan but I messed it up. 
I had to get back to the top of the tower, but I could see the thing already closing in on the cabin. There was no way my cabin could have resisted one of them getting inside. Even if I turned the light off, the one outside saw me enter the only source of light. Opening the door to the cabin, I tried running as fast as I could. I felt a burning in my knee that caused me to briefly limp. Then a searing tear appeared on my calf as the creature swept right through my flesh. I fell to the grass, smacking my face against the wet ground, kicking up mud. I rolled over to see the thing chomping at my legs. I pulled back just in time to avoid more damage. I could see around me more of those lights appearing out of the tree line. Desperately, I clawed towards the tower on my back, kicking with my uninjured leg to keep the thing at bay as best as I could. It occasionally got a good swing in, ripping my jeans and pulling at my shoe. I felt its jagged teeth dig into my boot. The rubber was thick enough that it didn't get through, but I just had to leave the boot behind. The other creatures were more interested in the light from my cabin, but I knew it wasn't going to stay that way for long. I had to hurry. Adrenaline started kicking in and I was able to close the gate behind me after a swift kick to the creature's face. I saw its enormous eyes deflate from the impact, leaving an empty sack of darkness with blood spilling onto the grass. I was not able to stand to lock the gate so I reached the railing and used it to help pull myself up while the creature was reeling. Each step up felt like hell as the wound from my leg mixed with the rain, fabric from my jeans continually sticking to the blood and pulling it loose. The thing at the gate gave a similar cry as earlier, and I looked back to see the other one's attention shifting to the tower. To me. They started closing in quickly before my view of them was cut off as I entered the lookout's tower interior. With my arms bracing the table, I pulled myself up and grabbed the flare gun before falling back to the floor. I could hear those things, their knife-like claws tapping against the stairs as they climbed towards me. I pointed the flare gun and pulled the trigger. The burning light sailed out of the gun and flew through the open door. It kept flying into the night, a bright red star against endless darkness. I just had to hope the ground had been saturated enough that it wouldn't cause any further fires. The sound of the creatures advancing halted as their attention shifted to the new source of light. The only source of light. The tapping began again, but the sound got softer and softer as they retreated. I pulled myself to the edge and watched as all the lights from their eyes ran after the one hurling through the sky. Like the wise men, they followed it far into the forest, where they would forget all about my little lookout tower. I would be stuck up here for a while, so I patched myself up with the first aid kit. When the storm finally parted and the sun peeked through the clouds, I radioed that I had suffered an animal attack and needed medical attention. Before long, I was being looked over and my wounds were being treated and sewn up. I was asked what attacked me and I said I didn't get a good look at it. I didn't think anyone would believe me about the creatures I saw that night. I didn't see another one of them for the remainder of the season, thankfully. I should really consider getting a gun, though. I'd be lying if I said that was the first night I witnessed something strange sitting in the lookout. Still, though, there's no view quite like it. The waves of green leading to the horizon. I'll never give up that view. I'll defend it with my life. This year, and the next. When we were children, we called out to our parents in the middle of the night. We made claims of monsters and hauntings. I cannot remember the world through the eyes of myself as a child. I cannot remember if those monsters were ever even there. All I remember is my dad coming in and telling me that the monsters were not real. Still, he would look all around my room, under my bed, and in my closet like he had a treasure map to find some sort of hidden treasure. As time went on, I would stop calling for him. No longer would I need his help to fend off dark visions because there were not any. I wonder if they were ever actually there. If they were maybe. Maybe they left because I spent so long being told they were not. Does it work the other way around though? So many adults wander through life knowing monsters are not real. What if you saw one? 
just by pure happenstance you came across something that you previously assumed did not exist. Would that knowledge sink into your mind and create a consciousness that could bear witness to all manner of oddities? A previously unseen world now visible with a new set of glasses. After those things assaulted me during the thunderstorm, I kept a closer eye on the trees. I watched the way they moved and felt my heart skip a beat whenever the wind pushed them around. Even with my fingers ready to grab the hunting rifle resting at my side, I used to go out into the woods with my dad and he would teach me how to shoot, how to observe nature around you, how it could help you predict what is next. Hell, oh, I was able to own a gun before I was able to drive a car. Though, I was never much of a hunter myself, it seemed the knowledge was going to come in handy. If anything, it sparked my love for being outdoors and eventually led me to where I am now. Every so often, telltale signs of brewing fires would rise from the evergreen. Smoke trailing high into the sky reaching towards an expansive blue. I would signal it in and watch the efforts to swiftly put it out. The stretches of green, as beautiful as they can be, turn into a single mass when you stare at them long enough. A plane of green static moving around the tower, every so often broken up by wisp of smoke or altitude climbing birds. For hours, I sat, watching the world around me as the sun dipped over into the horizon. Before I knew it, that heat that bounced around the lookout during the day had dissipated and the sun retreated. Darkness had made its inevitable return. It had been a few nights, almost a week since those creatures attacked me, but every day it felt like a fresh memory, like the attack happened only moments ago in my mind. I dreaded watching the trees at night, just waiting for a familiar light to start closing in on me, waiting for those things to come back to finish the job. Thankfully, the weather had let up and there had not been many more storms since. No sheets of rain distorting lights and no flashes of lightning revealing grotesque creatures. Still as I sat up in the tower, I felt my heart skip a beat when I spotted another source of light within the trees. My chair creaked as I straightened up to get a better view of it. This time though, I could tell by the way the light shifted and occasionally broke through the canopy that it was a flashlight, a powerful one at that. I wrestled with the choice of remaining stationary, but when remembering the beast that attacked me, I was not inclined to leave someone at the same fate. My fingers laced around the chilled metal of my rifle as I hoisted it over my shoulder, a leather strap running across my chest, holding the rifle in place. Closing the door behind me, I started heading down the stairs. Memories of the attack swam in my mind. I could feel the urge to run back up the steps as I made it to the bottom. Standing for a moment, I looked around to make sure there was not anything watching me. There was only the whistling of wind pressing through the branches. The ground pressed under my feet. Remnants of the previous storm still lingered and saturated the soil. Carefully, one step after another, I carried myself away from the safety of my watchtower. Further and further, I descended into the woods. Leaving the tower to venture into the woods at night typically was not advisable but I was not about to let some unsuspecting victims suffer from the things that attacked me. I kept my rifle at the ready. Its safety was still locked in place. I did not want something to startle me and suddenly a shot was ringing through the trees. My flashlight also kept in line with the barrel of the rifle. Small patches of light falling over large and brown tree trunks. Realizing just how little light my flashlight provided, I made a mental note to buy something better thinking that when I found the Lost Wanderer, I could ask them if they had one. As I made my way further through the trees, catching casual glances of the light I was chasing after, my eyes kept being drawn to the trees. The way the grooves ran up into the night sky, I kept feeling like I was looking at an alien landscape. I had traversed the forest countless times, but surrounded by the darkness with the memory of those creatures in my mind, I felt foreign. That is when a particular tree caught my eye, or rather, the pattern on the tree. The light beam in my hands fell over the impressive tree. Like all the others, the bark had deep grooves running up, but as I followed those grooves with my flashlight, I saw they tilted off. The pattern followed a large branch making the grooves arch overhead. What was stranger still was the branch contacted another branch from a separate tree. The other tree's grooves behaved 
very much the same way. As I stood there looking at the bigger picture of these grooves, I could not help but realize it looked like a gate. I had stopped moving. I had not noticed it, but I was standing before the gate crafted by the trees. Peering through the overarching branches, I could feel a pressure resting in my chest. It felt like when you hear a noise you do not recognize ringing out in your home at night. There is that stillness to it as you sit in bed waiting for something to make itself known. The thought of walking through the gate, causing the hairs on my arms to prick up. I took a few steps back that almost felt instinctual, like backing off from a predator. Then I heard the faint whisperings of conversation. I had gotten all turned around when I caught sight of the gate and somehow faced away from where I was heading. The trees have a way of doing that though, twisting your intended direction, taking you off course the moment you are not paying attention. It was strange. Even though I had gotten turned around, the voices were so close to me. As I swiveled to look at the source of the whispers, I could see a light pressing through the spaces afforded by the trees. I might have gotten mesmerized by the strange formations in the trees, but there was no way I could have missed it. No way I would notice how close I was to the people I was searching for. It was as if I had covered a sizable section of the forest floor within just a few steps. I was still trying to make sense of my footing as I cautiously stepped closer to the whispering. When I first caught sight of them, I felt a sinking in my heart. Maybe it was a trick of the light, but the human figures appeared first to me, wrapped in flames, unmoving and unbothered by the jacket of the heat thrown over them. Their heads turned to me, and within a blink, the flames that surrounded them vanished. I swear I could still see the vapors of extinguished flames rising off their bodies, much like the wisp of smoke I had been trained to spot. With the visage of destruction lifted, I could see the four younger figures sitting around the campfire. Well, younger compared to me. They had to be in their early twenties at least. They held cans in their hands. Fingers hide the label from me, but I made the safe assumption that it was alcohol. Stepping toward, I began opening my mouth, ready to scold them on the obvious dangers of having a fire in such a closed-off area of the forest. The ground was still wet, sure, but fire is unpredictable, and like water, it finds a way to its destination. One of the women there raised her hand, cutting off my speech. She explained that they made sure to soak the ground and the trees. They did not intend to burn down the woods. Not under your watchful eye, the woman said, words slipping through ruby lips. I thought it peculiar. That someone would wear a dress to go drinking in the woods. I caught myself staring at the waves of red fabric she wore, thinking perhaps that the initial sight of her dress is what caused my brief hallucination. See something you like, Alan? She spoke again, her words a soft hiss like the flow of gas seeping from the stovetop. What I interpreted as scorn misaligned with the smile and soft eyes that stared back at me. There was a muffled chuckle from one of the boys beside me. I felt as though I was being put on the back foot, but regardless, I needed to get them out of the forest. Even assuming they were completely safe from starting a blaze, those creatures might be attracted to their fire and they would be helpless to stop them. I thought until I investigated the fire. Much like the woman's dress, waves of rolling red covered a body. A small and frail shape crumpled up within the pits of the logs. The body's eyes were the most striking of all, the way they reflected the light from the flames back at me. It must have been etched into my face, my confusion, my attempts to turn gears and figure out what I was seeing. Out of the corner of my eye, the woman rose, much taller than I expected her to be. Don't worry, Alan. We're wrapping up here. There was a rolling realization that I had not introduced myself. In fact, I had not said anything at all to the kids. Turning my head, ready to press the issue, I could see the other three around the fire pouring the contents of their cans onto their heads. Amber liquid created a sheen over their hair. It ran down soaking their clothing, all the way to their sneakers. I stepped forward but remembered them telling me something around the lines that they had soaked the ground but never mentioned that they used water. The woman stood up. She looked lost and, out of sorts, green eyes darted back and forth. She looked at us, able to see beyond the bark and foliage. She looked like a child scanning the dark sky for alien spacecrafts, but still, her body marched to the woman in the red dress. 
Following suit of the others, the fiery fabric was stained darker by the liquid, the vapors describing the flow of something flammable. They could see flashes of memories, barbecues and days spent mowing the lawn. In those memories, she stood there, dress soaked, tainting each one of them. We just wanted to say congratulations. Her words snapped me back from the past I had fallen into. The other three repeated, Congratulations! Their words sounding so genuine that it betrayed the scenario playing out before me. On your rebirth, the woman concluded as she lifted her hand and in between two pinched fingers, I saw a matchstick. Given the circumstance, it felt like a loaded pistol had been aimed directly at my forehead. I stood shamefully unable to move a muscle. I cannot explain it. When those strange creatures showed up, I was afraid, but I was able to fight back. I was able to do anything but looking at them, all standing there, eyes so full of childlike wonder staring at me. I could not find it in myself to say or do anything. The woman in the red dress held up her other hand and cradled the chin of the other female who opened her mouth. It looked like when I was a kid, and a doctor would put a wooden spoon into my mouth and hold down my tongue. She reached into the girl's mouth with a match, and in one smooth movement, she ran the bulb of the stick along the roof of the woman's mouth. Like a snake, the flame hissed to life. She held the flame between the two of them, still cradling the other girl's head. A stern glance shot my way with a tooth grin she spoke. Don't let us down. Her final words punctuated when her lips met the other woman's and a spark ignited. I could almost see it in slow motion. Like time itself had dictated, I had to watch that I could not run from it. The fires I had been trained to stop swept over her body, blue led by red, flames eating every inch of her, vision ran through my mind, seeing the wave of the fire rummage. The surface of her body, I saw a great surge of fire sweeping over the forest like a tidal wave, something unstoppable and beyond me. All my memories flooded in and were swallowed up by the wave. For a moment I could see it, I could see it rushing through the woods beyond the burning effigies in front of me. My skin itched and burned as it drew closer, and just as I thought it might take me with it, the flames vanished. My breath was ragged. I could still feel a waft of heat with each pool of breath like I was taking a drag of a cigarette. I had not smoked in years, but the feeling was so unmistakable. Upon seeing that, the figures had vanished along with the wave of fire. I thought, or hoped, that that's the last time that I would see anything like this and this was all a dream. But I could still feel the heat in my lungs. I could still smell the vapor of gasoline. And as if dictated by fate, before me drifted a piece of fabric encompassed in embers that burned until the fabric had left my sight. Only the lingering senses reminded me that I had experienced something. I backed away, one step after another carrying me away from the scene. Like I was backing away from a bear, I treaded lightly, soft footsteps over soft ground. To my side trees passed by, their bark seemed to be burnt wrapped in twilight. No matter how hard I tried to not make sense of it, who they were, and how they knew my name, any of it, somehow a group of kids half my age put me more off center than a horde of monsters cornering me in my fire watch. From beyond the trees, as I continued to back up, I saw a familiar light. It was one of them. The things that had attacked me. I thought for a moment it was running at me, but it was limping. Its body smacking the ground when it could not support itself. The ground shook and suddenly something massive and dark slammed down on the creature. It vanished under whatever assaulted it. I looked up for a moment and thought there were two moons. I finally lost my footing and fell backward. As I did, I could see in my peripheral tree. One with familiar markings, averting my gaze away from the massive eyes staring back at me. I could see the branches above me that curved and twisted to form an archway. My back hit the ground with a thud, spine smacking against a rock, a feeling distinctly different than the soft soil I should have landed on. I arrived on the ground, pain swimming through my body. Slowly, I regained control of myself and struggled to my feet, rolling over. I braced my fingers on the ground, readying myself to stand up when I noticed the light brown surface between my fingers. Moving my fingers around, I found that the ground I was supposed to have fallen on was gone and in place was stone. The dust of the rock had covered my back, 
and I could feel its grit in between my fingers as I pushed up and rose to my feet. Bewildered, I observed my surroundings, smacking my hands against my pants. I looked out upon the sea of green once more. From the elevated cliff where I stood, I could see my fire watch tower peeking out near the horizon. Just by falling between those trees, I had moved what must have been close to a mile or two away from where I was. I could not help but feel like if something like that had happened to just some casual hiker, they would struggle to find their way home. Luckily, I could see my tower and had a direction to head in. With the sun rising, I started making my way back to the tower, even with a head saturated with questions. I had to man my post. Besides, I was not going to find any answers just standing there. I spent a while walking through the trees, paying close attention to the ways they twisted upwards, reaching to the sky like a choir of praise to the sun as it beams light, penetrating the canopy, guiding my way. Every so often I could feel residual pain from when I had fallen onto my back, but it wasn't enough to slow me down. It took almost two hours, but I was able to find my way back to the tower without any issues. I just paid attention to where the sun was in the sky and used it to keep my path straight despite the forest floor's best efforts to turn me around. Something I could not help but notice though, as I walked back to the tower, I noticed more and more of the trees were pulled into similar shapes as the ones I had fallen through. They weren't all obvious at first, but when I knew what to look for they started appearing everywhere. So much so, that it was any wonder that I had never noticed them before. Two trees in close proximity merging branches. It's a forest. Obviously branches from one tree will reach over to another. But these trees seemed purposeful, like their branches had been guided into place forming archways. I could not help but think of how terrifying it would be to step through one of those archways and just be somewhere else. Somewhere you had no knowledge of and your bearings were just gone. The thought spurred something in my mind. I couldn't remember it right then and there, but it was something I had heard before. Bizarre missing cases that take place in wooded areas. There is a name associated with it, but I could not put my finger on it. My head was too preoccupied trying to figure out my own circumstances. It took some time, and some cautious footwork to maneuver around the archways, but eventually, I made it to the watchtower. I had never been more thankful that my particular tower was one with running water. I stood in my shower, washing away the sweat and dirt I had accumulated throughout the night's events and morning walk. I could feel a rough skin on my hands as I pushed the water away from my face. There was a burning sensation that lingered in my palms, like I had touched a hot pan. I don't remember being close enough to the fire that it was able to burn me. I felt the heat, sure, but it was not able to warp my skin. Turning the water off, I could feel the vapor enter my lungs with every breath. I had forgotten to leave the window open to let the steam out. Having my lungs fill with that heat brought me back to the previous night. I knew eventually I was going to have to sit down and at least attempt to process what I had seen, but I wanted to push it off for as long as I could. I needed to be vigilant for the sake of the trees. Remembering that somewhere in the woods my rifle was laying loaded on the dirt unsettled me, but I could not go retrieve it until it got darker again. Instead, I climbed up the metal stairs I felt like I hadn't seen in weeks. Pulling the door open, I walked into my tower. The place felt unusual, like it wasn't mine. I shook off the nerves and sat down. I hadn't slept since the night before and the exhaustion was getting to me. Trying my best to keep my eyes open, I scanned the horizon for any telltale signs of brewing danger. I could hear my chest raising and lowering as I struggled to keep my posture upright. Fingers tapping against the side of my face, chin resting on my palm. I could feel my head becoming heavy. The more I fought it, the more the trees out of my windows started to look like one singular mass like I was guarding one massive mile-wide stump as opposed to the entire forest my waning vision rested over. As that vision started failing me, and I felt the grasp of slumber rushing throughout my body, 
I could see out the window. A small thin vein of smoke rising from the trees. The gray ribbon was nearly impossible to make out with my eyesight, so close to failing me. But nevertheless, I saw it. My mind registered it just as my eyes became too heavy and I was unable to open them again. My world was black. I couldn't tell you how long it was like that. I felt as though as I was in some great waiting room, shifting between sleep and dream. In that dark, I could feel on my cheeks a tingling, a sensation that grew stronger and stronger until it was a bright searing on my face. Finally, I was able to open my eyes and for a moment I thought the sunset had besieged my tower. Bright glows of amber and mustard filled the interior of the tower. Each breath as I struggled awake was full of heat. I worked in fast food restaurants way back when I was a teen. I remember the feeling of leaning over a hot stove all day. The way it'll feel like your skin is sizzling. I tried to kick my consciousness into overdrive, but my body was still sluggish and struggling to wake back up. It wasn't until I noticed that I wasn't alone in the tower that adrenaline truly kicked in and my senses began returning to me. My focus returned to me, and I learned of my naive assumption about the sunset. The view in front of me was distorted by waves of heat rising all around me. The small wisp had matured into a raging inferno. Out of my window, I could see flames licking the sky, failing to spare any inch of green. Embers rose above the flames being carried along by thick columns of dark smoke. It was a fire that stretched further than I could even see. There wasn't a hint of untouched forest, only a sea of orange and yellow. And the man watching it all, the figure standing a few feet in front of me, shadowed by the glow of flames. I could tell his back was turned to me. He watched the flames like a captain observes the sea. My mouth opened. I tried to speak, but as I did, I could see the embers spilling out of my mouth instead of the intended questioning. The figure started to shift. Still hidden in silhouette, he turned to me and brought a finger up to his face, presumably to offer me a shushing motion, as if I was interrupting something. His eyes were about the only thing I could make out, their gloss reflecting the ambers of the fire around us. This is all for you. His words were shaky. They mimicked the way my vision was distorted by the heat. He looked back to the fire and I could see in the distance a wave rushing towards us. The man raised his arms, stretching his fingertips out to the side, ready to embrace the flames. His body shook under the veil of heat as we both watched the stretch pillar of flames rushing toward us. The fire engulfed the already raging flames and plundered the pillars of smoke. I could see how the flame rose into the air, but I could feel just how dwarfed I was by its presence. I felt insignificant. Cleanse us. I heard the man whisper as the flames reached the cabin and shattered through the glass windows. Soon the man's body vanished behind the wall of fire, and I heard the fire as it prepared to consume me as well. It sounded like a wild beast, untamed as it roared. As it reached me and my body, it jerked me off the chair, sending me onto the floor. I heard some of those loose things in my cabin rattle as it made impact. I tried to shield myself from the flames until realizing how cool the metal underneath me felt. Realizing the cabin I was in had become dark, not by flames, but by twilight. I slowly stood up from the floor, looking around, and I observed that night had fallen upon the forest, etched the vibrant greens into a somber and muted face. My breathing was still heavy, but I managed to get it under control with each passing breath. Remembering the small silk of smoke I had seen before passing out, I rushed over to the window. There was a small patch of trees that I could tell had been burned. I hadn't had the time to call in that fire, though. I considered the possibility that it just put itself out. I mean, that's not entirely unheard of. There are other towers, sure but they are far enough away that they would not be able to see such a small trail of smoke. Though my ability to process strange happenings was starting to harden. In any case, the fire was put out and I was able to be thankful that my lack of rest didn't burn the whole place down. Though, I made a note to be more careful of my sleep schedule. Sitting in my chair, 
I tried to radio to the nearest tower, but received no response when doing so. Assuming the others were likely sleeping, then, as I considered my next move, a glint of light caused me to wince when it hit my eye. I almost cursed. Two nights prior, sources of light had led me to unsettling discoveries. I looked in the direction of the light, and it was fairly far away, but I could see where it was coming from. I let my eyes adjust to the darkness to try and get a better look of what was causing the light. It hung over the trees, and slowly, I was able to make out the shape of a structure. It was visible just above the tree line. Confusion nestled in my mind as I was pretty sure I would remember if I was able to see one with my naked eye. But sure enough, there one was. Another watchtower, with something signaling to me. It was a long walk, but I took a good look at where the tower was, and an idea settled in, as reckless as it was. After a while of silently walking through the trees, I managed to find it. Though it was slightly covered by the brush, bending over, I wrapped my fingers around the rifle I dropped last night, and upon looking up, I could see a familiar set of trees beckoning my curiosity. I knew the area well enough, though I couldn't see the tower earlier. I knew its direction, and if the trees were consistent, then I'd be able to make it with pretty good time. I also knew a shortcut, so why not? With a heavy breath, I stepped through the archway crafted of bark. As I did, I could feel my sense of direction and balance kilter for a moment before getting solid footing again. Sure enough, it worked. I had traveled a large distance and only a few steps. I had returned to the cliff that rattled my back the previous night. In my head, I made a note to mark that tree shortcut on my map in the tower when I got back. But quickly, I was reminded of the problem at hand as the glint of light once again located me. Turning to face its source, I saw the other tower in the distance looming over me completely shrouded by dark sky behind it. Only the glint light made it stand out. It still took me a while to get close to the base of the tower, but a considerably less amount of time than it would have if I didn't take the shortcut. As I approached the tower, I picked up on the smell of battery acid and iron. Approaching the chain-link fence that surrounded the tower, I heard a squishing under my boots. Pointing my flashlight down revealed the dirt beneath me had been saturated, though it should have been dried out by then. For a moment, my mind flashed to those kids pouring gasoline on themselves, but the scent in the air didn't match that scene. This time, I was not willing to take any chances and flip the safety off of the rifle. I didn't like the shade of red the dirt had taken on, thanks to the liquid. A liquid that continued to infiltrate the ground as I stepped closer to the tower. The air was still and filthy with the battery acid smell. Still, I braved the steps of the tower. I wanted to call out, hoping that someone was up there. That was just like me, but my words caught like embers in my throat. Slowly, I ascended the stairs keeping an ear out for any whining metal that could indicate movement above me. I kept my rifle at the ready. It made taking my steps feel awkward, but I took it slow and refused to be reckless. Looking down at the steps, I could see that there were streaks of red running up alongside of them all the way to the top of the cabin. Through the window, despite how dark the night had become, I could see someone was in there. They stood, looking at the window in the direction of my watchtower, like they had never seen me leave. Cautiously, I twisted the handle and pushed the door open to the cabin. I audibly made my presence known, and let them know that I was brandishing a firearm. I was still fumbling with my light, as I asked the man if everything was okay, inquiring if he was the one who had caught the fire from earlier. Trying to steady my gun, the flashlight proved difficult and the light dropped from my hand smacking against the floor. It was so much louder than I was comfortable with and I apologized bending down to get it. As I grabbed it, I heard a noise that wasn't my own. It was a bead of liquid smacking against metal. I look up at the man slowly and a sinking feeling started to invade my chest. Afforded by the moonlight, I could see the man's posture. 
The way he stood there with his arms held out to the side like he was preparing to embrace a great wave of flames. I rested my light on him, revealing all of the details to me. The tripping sound continued as I stood in awe, feeling like my shoes have soldered to the floor, like my bones were made of marble. His clothing was tattered and ripped, singed on the edges. I could see dark spots where his skin had turned to ash. I could see the several cords that suspended his body in the air to keep his vigilant watch going after death. I stepped closer, looking at the ropes that held his arms out, looking at the small running threads of red that soaked his clothes and dripped onto the floor. Rounding to get a good look at the front of him, it was hard to make anything out. His skin and clothing were scorched. It was any wonder that his body was being held together at all. Thanks to the nature of the ropes and the amount of slack they had, his body was able to move slightly, just enough to allow the moonlight to reflect off the dog tags hanging around his neck. Every so often the light would catch just right and it would become a bright light enough to be seen through the canvas of darkness. For the life of me, as I stood there, I couldn't recall that tower ever being there. I would remember any tower being so close, much less a manned one. I did not recognize the name on the dog tags either. I had known my co-workers that I shared shifts with pretty well. Though volunteers do come and go, Richard L. Bennings, from what I could tell from the tags, was not somebody I ever knew. He was a rather old soul, probably just looking for a peaceful retirement. I couldn't help but feel a longing of sorrow for him. Strange, though how badly his body had been burned and yet the surrounding cabin was unaffected. It was messy, sure. It looked like there was a struggle but nothing had been burned. There was something I recognized in the mix of it all though. Richard was about halfway through the book on the desk behind him. It was a phrase I had been trying to remember since last night. My fingers ran over the raised letter of the book, missing 411. That's what I had been trying to recall. I'm sure there's morals against pillaging from a dead man, but I figured I ought to finish the thing for him. I needed to get out of there. Whatever happened, the longer I was there, the more trouble I was going to cause for myself and others. I could figure things out if I could just get one more night to mull things over. I know that Richard didn't do that to himself. Something happened outside that tower, and somehow he made it to the top. Whether he made it up there or he was dragged, I considered the possibility that it could be those creatures I warded off, but I quickly discovered that wasn't the case. I started leaving when my flashlight briefly pressed against the large map on his wall. Sections of the map were burned, etching words over the layout of the forest. A message had been left. I stood for a while, longer than I should have, honestly, breathing in Richard's remains while the shaky voice repeated in my head, searing into my thoughts. I stayed there for a while. I felt like I needed to catch my breath. Eventually, I left the cabin and the cold air smacked me in the face. Like a cool rush of water, my senses were brought back to life and given enough time, I found my way back to my watchtower. My tower wasn't the cleanest place in the world, but compared to the one I had left behind, it felt brand new. Before I could really settle down, I made sure to contact someone about the body I had found. The local authorities were notified, and I was assured they would investigate the situation immediately and thoroughly. I was surprised that they didn't seem to suspect that I had any hand in it. If they did, they were hiding it well, though I'm sure I wouldn't be a hard person to find should they need to question me further. Sitting in my lookout, my eyes couldn't help but wander over to where the other tower was. It did not matter how hard my eyes focused, I could not make out the tower in the distance, only the eternally stretching wave of green. Every so often, I would thumb through the book I found at the other tower. I read stories of strange disappearances related to the wooded areas, tales of people vanishing out of thin air, sometimes mere feet away from other people. The trees can be wicked 
and a force to lose track quickly in, but some of the stories were insane. People would vanish and be found miles and miles away. Children would disappear and be found in fields they had no business being in. It was as if they were plucked from the forest and simply placed somewhere else entirely. Surprisingly enough, I was able to read a fair bit of the book, and as the sun started to set there were hardly any fire sightings. It was a quiet day. As the land grew dark once again, I got antsy, expecting some sign of life below to draw me out into another adventure. Another hour or so ticked by and nothing happened. I was admittedly relieved. I could feel the stress that everything had put onto my body and lord knows I needed a rest mentally. Eventually, I descended the tower and entered my little cabin. The bed felt more comfortable than it ever had. It took me a while to fall asleep, still plagued by the things that I witnessed recently. Sleep did arrive though. Darkness incinerated my racing thoughts. I don't know what dreams were conjured, but I didn't recall any great waves of fire or burning trees. I dare say, I felt amazing upon waking up. The sun was just beginning to peek through the window. It was a battle to convince myself to get out of bed. Regardless, my aging wooden frame creaked as my weight shifted and I pulled myself out of bed. I was still a little sore but invigorated. I climbed the tower and watched for signs of smoke. It was another uneventful day, but while I sat there, I started coming up with a plan. Some way I could map out where the trees would take me. Once night came around, I walked through the woods and whenever I would see a gate crafted by the trees, I would throw a piece of cloth through. I would try to make one cloth distinct from the other to remember what tree they belonged to. Sure, it wasn't a perfect plan. There were plenty of holes in it, but at the very least I couldn't find any of the cloth. I would know that the gates led to somewhere far away. Far enough for some kid to suddenly find himself lost in a cave. I did that for a few nights, and to my surprise I found a few pieces of cloth. Whenever I did, I made sure to mark on my map where the shortcut led to. It wasn't much, but it felt like I had more control over my life by taking initiative. A few days went by like that. During the day, I would make sure no fires broke out, and at night I would scour the forest floor for stray pieces of cloth, all while trying my best to understand the circumstances that led me to wandering around the forest at night. Eventually, I even started to convince myself that maybe the happenings were done. I hadn't seen any strange happenings in a few days. I thought maybe it was all just leading me to the other watchtower maybe, or that it was just all happenstance, and I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The thought was comforting. I could just go back to life how it was before, hiding away in my tower, keeping the woods from burning up. Thoughts like that are all too comforting and all too simple. It was about a week or so into doing this every single night that my routine suddenly became interrupted. I was walking through the woods as normal, a flashlight beam searching for any gates I might have missed when I happened to cross another figure. I stopped in my tracks and kept the light on him. His head was tilted to the side, his body was stark. Even with the flashlight on him, it looked like he was made of darkness. It reminded me of when I found Richard. The man stood there basking in my light. Around me, I could hear the foliage being compressed and shifted around, moving my flight li Moving my flashlight towards the intrusion, I found similar figures. Skin turned to the color of soot, slowly surrounding me on all sides. I should have been more scared, sure, but from what I saw, none of them were armed, and I was. When they all halted their steps, I returned my light to the man standing before me, who had since turned to face me. I got a good look at his face, and it was enough to strike a little fear in me. There was hardly anything left that resembled a human face. No features that I could pick out and identify with. His face had been so scorched, I could almost see the ember still burning under his skin. It was rugged, dark, and twisting. He and the others around me were wearing masks etched onto them by a flame. The more I stared at the man, 
who stood motionless in my direction, and where the twisting scars resembled bark on dying trees. If I didn't blink often enough, the man would start to meld with the world behind him. You are close now. I couldn't see the man's mouth moving, yet the voices were very clearly coming from him. His voice was shaky and full of bass like the voice I had heard in my dream. Then he took a step towards me. I could hear the leaves around me shifting as the others mimicked his movement. My heart raced and I quickly raised my gun and pointed the barrel at the man in front of me. Checking my peripherals, I made sure the others weren't trying to make a move on me. I tried to keep my head cool, but the gravity of the situation was starting to fold in on me. They all stopped, each twisted mockery of a human. Every smoldering, desecrated figure still as statues around me. I kept the rifle held up high as I tried to slow my breathing. I could feel the gun rattling in my hand. It was shaky, but I was close enough. I didn't want to shoot if I didn't have to. Sure, I could have taken down one or two, but if the others rushed me, I, I would be in a bad way. There were at least eight of them around me, with no certain means of escape. It's almost time for you to cleanse us, he spoke once more. My mind flashed to the dream, the wave of fire, how the heat felt against my face. I briefly remembered Richard's watchtower, and the words burned into the map. My fear was beginning to dissipate, being replaced by another set of emotions. As I imagined the dream, I could see the wave sweeping the land and engulfing my wife and our newborn. I could see the fire licking away at their skin, turning them to ash and scarring their skin until they were completely unrecognizable. My fingers wrapped around the grip of my rifle as a hot rage welled up. My foot moved of its own volition and my finger flipped the safety off. The gun shaking halted. My teeth would have broken if I clenched them any harder. That's enough. The sound of my own voice shocked me. I didn't hear myself too often when I'm out on watch. It was rougher than I remembered it being. What is all of this? I shouted. I could hear my voice bouncing through the trees. What's all this shit? Beads of spit left my mouth as the volume drew up. I could feel my heart pounding as my face went red. Their bodies seemed to react to my voice. Like magma was flowing under their skin. I would see hues of red pulse when I spoke. Who are you? I demanded. Stern hands aimed for the stranger's head. The shape stepped back. Once again, the sounds of leaves and dirt shifting alerted me as the others were moving in, in unison, but this time they were walking away. I shouted, trying to get their attention, as I swiveled to aim at them. I, they, they just weren't paying me no mind, and this was making me so angry. My attention quickly returned to the one who spoke to me when he started retreating further as well. My footsteps advanced to match his. Don't run away now, I prodded. Turning his back to me, the figure wasn't phased in the slightest by my threats. Instead, he continued to walk even as I yelled after him. Anything I could say to try to get him to speak again. Just as I thought he was turning with intention to face me, he stepped behind a tree and I moved my rifle to the other side, waiting for him to emerge from behind it. I stood still for a moment before it dawned on me. I cursed at myself and hurried to where the figure stepped behind the tree. And I moved my rifle to the other side of it, waiting for him to emerge from behind it. I stood still for a moment before it dawned on me. I cursed at myself and hurried to where the figure stepped behind the tree. Sure enough, the limbs of the tree were twisted and arched over to the next. It was a shortcut. I couldn't hear anything other than my own breathing. They must have all taken shortcuts. I thought about entering after him, but my mind whirred to the possibility that they would be waiting for me on the other side, ready to ambush me. Going back and forth in my mind on whether to follow, I felt my chest tighten up and the hairs on my arms stand. Just as I exhaled, an enormous shape emerged from the shortcut and ran into me. It felt like getting hit by a bus. My shoulder smacked a nearby tree, and as I went spiraling through the air, after a second or two of flight, I landed on the thankfully forgiving soil. I could already tell my shoulder was going to have a nasty bruise. Other than that, I was trying my best to get some air back in my lungs even though my body resisted. 
When I was mobile enough, I inched my way over to the tree and rested my back against it. Ignoring the pain radiating in my shoulder as best as I could, I pulled the rifle up and aimed it at the darkness before me. I sat and waited for any sign of movement from what had hit me. The ground I was still laying on seemed to vibrate and I could hear a low hum coming from the sound from the shroud. When I saw it, two silver saucer eyes peering at me through the trees. The eyes rested at nearly double my height. Its form shifted back and forth, eyes scanning through the trees trying to locate where it had thrown me. I was too afraid to make a move. Thankfully, the strap kept my gun at my side, but my flashlight had been thrown clear from me. I couldn't even navigate the woods if I wanted to run. I would surely run face first into a tree during my panic. I made slow and cautious movements toward the beam of light, laying on the ground. My first course of action was to grab the light. As I drew closer, my eyes staring at the light, I saw the creature's hand slam down into the beam, casting a shadow against the tree. It was large enough to palm my head. Its fingers were stiff and twisting. Strands wrapped around its fingers. It almost looked like old wound up chain link fencing. It was dark though, like the burned flesh of the figures I saw moments ago. I halted my breath and went still again as I hear the thing huffing around, trying to catch sight of me. My body was covered in dirt from the fall and I could only assume it was masking my scent enough to hide me. Looking up, I remembered the creature that chased me when I saw those kids immolate themselves. Its eyes were much the same. Soon the beast gave up where it was searching and moved on leaving me free to grab the flashlight. I didn't think the thing was attracted to light as it would have gone immediately for the flashlight instead of wandering around. I took the opportunity to raise the flashlight to get a better look at its body. It was starting to walk away from me so I didn't think I would have another chance and curiosity was burning a hole through me. The wiry nature that made up the creature's hand was consistent throughout the rest of its body. It looked like a mass of old, rusted wire fencing molded into the shape of a creature. Though the wire did appear more organic, the longer I looked at it. Each strand seemed like it could move independent from the rest of its body. The wires twisted and shaped into a bipedal being that hunched over, its arms seeming to hold more weight than the legs did. The legs almost seemed more like tree trunks, wires sprouting out and digging into the soil like, like roots. It started to shift towards me, and I heard the humming again. It appeared like the noise was just created by the wires rubbing against each other. I slowly rose to my feet as its gaze scanned, and I pulled myself behind a tree trying to hide from its sight. I could hear it moving closer to the tree when I halted just on the other side of it. I could see the light its eyes were giving off, creating soft shadows on the ground. Trying to keep my breath quiet, I hoped it would pass. Instead, I felt something rub up against the shoulder that was injured. I couldn't help but wince when pressure was put on the wound and the cable that agitated it quickly retreated. There was a monstrous roar as dozens of wires started emerging from the sides. They moved in front of me like they were intending to pin me to the tree. Instead, I lowered my frame and made a run for it. It already knew where I was. The hiding game was one that I lost. My feet were moving as fast as I could through the trees. I didn't know where I was heading, only that I hoped the gaps in the trees gave my smaller size an advantage. A quick glance back proved that that was naive. It was almost like the thing wasn't running after me. It was like it was swimming. The way the cords reached out and pulled it forward made it more liquid-like in nature. I also got a brief look at this thing's face. There, the two saucer rested behind a mask of discarded and eroded animal skulls, crudely held together by the same wires it was made up of. I wondered where this thing came from, where the gate the burn the individual entered led to. Was it a land where these things existed, or was it being held captive somewhere? How far could the gates take you? To the other side of the earth? Other planets? Separate realities? Where would such a creature naturally exist? The gate stirred an idea in my head, and suddenly I knew where I was going. I could vaguely make out my tower in the distance, and after figuring out where I must be, 
I took a hard right and headed to my destination. My heart was already pumping so fast, and my breathing was getting ragged, not to mention the constant sting my shoulder gave off every time I pumped my arm. Though it was a miracle, I could move as well as I was after taking such a hit. Every time I glanced back at the thing, I was filled with some sort of uncertain horror. It seemed so alien but moved through the forest like it had spent its whole life there. Turning back, I saw my destination approaching and dropping for just a moment as I swiveled to face this thing. Raising the rifle up, I heard the shot crack through the air. The bullet hit the animal skulls it was wearing, splintering the bone. The fibers rattled, and it gave out an awful buzzing roar that sounded like it was caught in a swarm of locusts. Then it charged at me, really charged. The delicate way it moved through the forest was gone. Instead, its body crashed and maimed the trees around it as it approached me. Hoping my plan would work, I turned again as I ran as fast as I could, though the sounds behind me indicated it was gaining ground quickly. My heart nearly gave out. I ran until I passed through two trees. I had seen time and time again. I planted my feet as firmly as I could, resisting my own momentum. I threw my body to the side. The rock face beneath me was not kind to the shoulder that I landed on. I couldn't help but let out a scream of my own, but I had made it to where I wanted to be. The creature initially attacked me through a gate, and I planned to use one to fight it on my own terms. I watched as the thing's body rushed through. It rushed through the gate seemingly appearing out of thin air. This was the first gate I had ever encountered. The same one it made me fall through the night I saw those teens. It was so strange. This thing's body was so large, and it was moving so recklessly it had no chance to alter its path or know what was coming next. I watched as the thing's momentum carried it right off over the cliff. I found myself standing so many nights ago. The wires reached out from his body trying to grab onto the edge but the mass of the main body was just too much. It sailed through the air and I felt some catharism. Knowing how just moments ago it had caused me to fly. The cliff was high. I had no idea if the height was enough to damage it let alone kill it. I struggled to sit up so I could watch its form shifting, trying to gain purchase anywhere. My eyes focused as its frame slammed into the top of the trees that gored it like a picket fence. Then the thing's body vanished beyond the canopy. There was a dense scream that emitted from where the impact was. I waited a while, seeing if any movement would occur, but nothing ever came of it. Just the stillness of the forest. Pulling my hand away from my shoulder, I looked at my palm. It looked as if it had been resting over a fire. Putting both my palms side by side, I could clearly see the damage. My left palm looked so aged and scarred it resembled tree bark. From within the scar, I saw drift up a small ember. I watched the spark lift into the night sky until my watchtower became visible again, and I prepared for my long walk home. It's almost time. It felt like I had found myself on that cliff far too many times. Staring out at the cluttered trees below me, observing from a distance my tower, its figure always just managing to make its way above the tree line, stoic and lonely waiting for my arrival. Morning was starting to arrive, traces of sunlight peppering the top of the trees. Standing there for long enough, I felt safer in the assumption that the creature had perished during its plummet, that or it was too weak to move. Letting the rising sunlight my way, I carefully made my descent down the side of the cliff. There was enough of a slope near where the gate had deposited me that I could safely make it down. I kept my eyes focused on where I had last seen the creature as I made my way down. Eventually, I passed through the dense tree line and emerged below the canopy once more. My shoulder was still aching a great deal, but it was something I could ignore if I focused on what was in front of me. More than anything, I wanted to see the creature to confirm its passing, or at the very least get a good look at the thing. As I started to get a view of where the thing landed, I could see its frame retreating behind a thick tree. 
At first, I was worried the thing was still capable of movement, but as I watched it became increasingly clear, something else was tugging at it. The limbs were not articulating and the wires that made its body had become firm and motionless. Nothing like the lively swimming organism I had just been chased by a moment ago. I could barely make out the figures that were pulling the lumbering mass away. Their skin is a familiar burnt and scarred shade. My body became still, fingers lacing the tree next to me to maintain support for my shoulder. Almost. Felt like I had stopped breathing completely for a second, chest failing to rise and fall. With great effort, the figures pulled the creature's limp body further away from me. I could hear it displacing the ground as it relocated, digging grooves into the dirt, revealing the cool soil underneath. Crumbling leaves that had long since fallen off the trees, becoming dried and fragile. Cautious movements allowed me to sneak even closer, making sure only to advance when the sound of the creature dragging was present. There was a feeling of familiarity with the people who were dragging the corpse. There were only a handful of them, though their bodies were so disfigured and burnt that it would be impossible to place any kind of recognition beyond the same type of people I had seen earlier in the night. Intently, my eyes followed their movements until one by one they began vanishing as they passed between another gate. Like it was being swallowed by the earth, the creature began to vanish alongside the figures, its legs being eaten by the gate, pulled further and further in by lumbering movements until eventually... The thing was entirely gone and out of my sight. I was alone in the forest again, but I didn't feel like it. There was still the sensation of company, like a party was happening just out of earshot. My body trembled, my fingernails dug into the bark of the tree threatening to crack if I pressed any harder. I was being watched and I could feel it, distant and intent eyes observing me like I had been moments before. The sense of a foreign threat and an overwhelming curiosity battled until one won out and my feet advanced. It's funny how different a place can feel when your intentions within shift. Imagine an abandoned home. Your perspective of that home shifts dramatically when considering intention. The worn down interior can seem exhausting and time consuming if you go there with the intention to fix it up and flip it. The very same interior can seem foreboding and intimidating if you go there and try to coax out some specter of the afterlife. For me, the force shifted as my intention to follow those beings through the gate began to steady in my mind. It all felt alien, like the trees were alive and reaching out for me. I half expected branches to wrap around my arms and hold me in place, forbidding me from prodding at the secrets they protect. But I was too far gone for that. At any point, I should have turned back and dropped it. I had so many chances to forget about anything I had seen, walk away from it. I think since the very beginning that was never an option. I had gone to the tower to get away, run away from the things that had been troubling me, and try to escape. Something like this, something I could busy my mind with isn't a situation I could pull myself away from. I would always need to know. So as alien limbs reached out for me, branches of malice closing in around me, I stood in front of the gate. Aware of my foolishness, but no good road has ever been paved without a little foolishness. I watched my movements, stiff and on guard as I swung my leg through the gate. I was surprised that I could still see my foot when it crossed the threshold. I had never taken a good look at what happens when you cross a gate before. I'd always just kind of went through. As it were, my body continued through once the entirety of me made it past the gate. I had shifted. Immediately, that old familiar coating of heat rested on the back of my throat with one inhale. Tendrils of fever ran their grips over any exposed part of my body that they could find. I was appalled. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust and even when they had, it was hard to keep them from stinging. The moment I would blink, the liquid that coated my eyes would seem to evaporate under the heat's advance. Looking around, it seemed like I hadn't moved in the way of other gates would move me. Things were different. Turning around, I could still see the rising cliff face that I just descended from. It was easy to see without any green foliage blocking my line of sight. The brown rocks had been singed a dark charcoal color. 
My curiosity started to dissipate, melting away. I almost hadn't seen them at first. As I tried to observe my surroundings, they just blended in with the trees. The hunched over and stiff figures around me. Those people, the burned ones, were all resting on trees or wrapping their arms and legs around them, almost like they were trying to become part of the trees. They looked like they might have been accomplishing their goal. Their dark and tainted skin nearly camouflaged them against the incinerated remains of the trees. The tree lay barren, a forest of burned toothpicks jutting up, trying to poke a hole in the dark red sky. None of it felt real. None of it felt like it could have been real. I stood there, waiting for the cool night air to press against my cheek, waking me up from my slumber. It was a relief I was never afforded, though. There wasn't a sign. The beast I had passed through the trees in hope of following. Just the dark humans pinned to the trees around me. Though in the distance I felt like I could sense a rumbling, something massive moving beyond the horizon. Every so often, I thought I caught a sight of the tendrils of the beast. But these visions were fleeting. Chasing them would send me far into uncertain territory. I don't know how long I stood there, just looking at the mess before me a complete mockery of the lush green forest I had known moments ago. It felt like the rational result of the dream I had, that great rushing wave of flame that pressed me into the tower. As I thought of that dream, I saw him with his back turned to me, the same being that whispered to me before the fire took us. What was meant to burn will always burn. His voice pulled through the air carried by Wisp. What was meant to burn? Already has, he reiterated. It's almost like it didn't feel like the voice was coming from him, more like some ethereal force that was projecting the words into the heat soaked in the air around me. I started to move in a circle, slowly making my way around him, trying to get a good look at the rest of him, but no matter how far or fast I moved, his back was always turned to me. He wasn't moving though. The backs of his heels didn't shift a bit but I never managed to see any more than the scarred and burned back he had turned to me. Where am I? I managed to mutter out, feeling my cracked lips pressed against each other. My own voice sounded ethereal. The heat was getting to me, and my throat was dry and ragged. Words came out like sandpaper. All the while, my feet continued to press down on the ground. Leaves and dirt painted so, dark from flames, it seemed the universe rested under me. It's so happening as one. The flames destroy. Time rebuilds. You are here. My eyes furrowed, focused, waned. I was getting tired of the way these people had been speaking to me. Nothing but answers reaching through vague conclusions. Though, I wasn't completely lost in what he was referencing. I've read a great number of books on my watch. One book made passing references to time and how it functioned. That everything was happening all at once. Our consciousness, however, is limited to experiencing life in a linear fashion. So the green forest I watched over and the destroyed forest I struggled to breathe in, they exist side by side. The gate didn't take me somewhere else, it was shifting the point where my consciousness was preordained. I continued walking around him, failing to make progress. I didn't even see the tree pass by me. He was gone. His visage vanished. Instead, were two of the burned figures, one hunched over the other. Cautiously, I approached them. They were covered in ash, just like the others, but they felt familiar, they felt safe. The world around me had the constant hiss of crackling flames, the licking pop of sparks being born and dying within an instant. I knelt by the figures. One was smaller than the other, a child reaching out, almost instinctively. My fingertips pressed against a larger figure's cheek. Ash started falling away, revealing flush and unharmed pale flesh. It was soft and comforting. Ash continued to fall away from the figure revealing more and more of her features under their image, and the image of the child were clear to me. She looked at me, her eyes wide and uncertain. She was struggling to comprehend what she was seeing, the world of flames around her. Why are you doing this? Her soft voice felt like a plush blanket. A voice I had missed for so very long. I couldn't pull my eyes away from her. The whole world around me smelled like sulfur and gas 
but the stench was so loud kneeling next to her. Her eyes were so blue, though, I could feel myself wavering. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe everything will work out. But the more I looked into her eyes, the more I thought about those eyes looking up at someone else, being under someone else. More and more I focused on her pupil as it dilated, responding and fixating on a new source of light. I could see it too in her eye. Even as the liquid dripped down from her forehead, the awful smelling liquid, I could see the small peck of red in her eyes. She couldn't take her gaze away. It didn't matter how much she tried to plead, how much begging, how many tears mixed with the gasoline. I could feel my lips moving again, cracked and dehydrated strips of pale red flesh pressing against one another. What was meant to burn will always burn. The same ethereal voice rang out. My voice, tired and ragged. I stood as the match dropped from my hands. I watched again as she was engulfed in flames. Her voice penetrated the flames, crying out like I could stop such a powerful force if I wanted. I was too lost, too preoccupied watching her burn. I couldn't feel the room burning around me. I forgot myself. Then, her visage was gone. The flames dissipated, and sparks were carried away by the wind. I backed away, feeling a whirl in my stomach. I leaned over, releasing my innards into the dark grass. A clear liquid poured from my throat. It stung like I had drunk battery acid. More and more screaming erupted around me. I heard a rushing beside me. Something was approaching quickly. I turned to see the charred individuals were charging me now. Before I could put my arms up, they slammed into me, throwing us both into the ground. I must have passed through a gate when I was hit. The annihilated forest returned to the life-filled one I remembered. My back hit the ground as the figure continued to salt. It got on top of me and landed a blow to the side of my head. Going dizzy for a moment, I returned my gaze to the male on top of me. Kicking up, I managed to land a clean hit on the kid's stomach, making him reel back. My hand searched the ground next to me as I was able to quickly locate my rifle. Pulling up, I aimed at the attacker, demanding he halt, that they all stop in their tracks. At the end of my rifle, I could see the four of them glaring at me, an array of different expressions, different intents, particularly the set of blue eyes staring at me from the ground. She was laying on her back, soaked. I looked at a can of lighter fluid next to her, the same one I dropped when the body tackled me. What a hero. I made sure to aim the barrel at him. Out of the four of them, he was the most likely to probably attack again. The other two had their hands up. I just needed them to stand where they were a little longer, as the fluid soaked into the ground. One of them started to speak. Their lips began moving, but the words I heard didn't match up to their desperate mumbling. All I could hear from the girl on the ground was, Cleanse us, repeated ad nauseum. Slowly, I started lowering my rifle. Their expressions shifted. I could see sparks of hope trifling their mind. I could feel the corners of my mouth turn up, a reassuring smile. They were going to be okay. I could feel it. The great wave of fire at my back, swiftly, reaching back and grabbing the cold plastic stuffed into my pants. I retrieved the flare gun. Before any of them could move, I pulled the trigger. The flames were so quick to take her. I watched them devouring the red fabric that wrapped her. She started writhing around as the flames reached out and grabbed one of the others. Whenever I first showed up, I got as much of them as I could. They smelled so bad, but it had to be done. One after the other, they caught flame. The boy who attacked me, though, he started to run. A loud crack rang out the recoiling, pushing the rifle back into my shoulder. I could still feel the sting of it. The boy dropped. I had plenty of time to pull him back to the other. He wouldn't have to get cleansed alone. I stood and watched. They eventually gave up. I was worried I would have to use another bullet, but their resistance came to an end long before the flames did. More and more of the flames took them, altered them. Over time, their skin shifted from the lively hues they once had until they resembled burned tree bark, cracks in their skin forming from flames only to darken themselves, watching them burn their bodies slowly turning into husk of vague entities of what they once were. Their eyes always remain, though, small beads of silver that reflect the moonlight, small sparks of what they once were. It took a while for the fire to burn out completely. 
I wasn't going to let it spread through the forest, though. That was my job, after all. I thought about my job for a moment. Though, I thought about sitting in the tower snuffing out all those fires. I thought about the smoke from the fire. I had just seen started rising into the air. I was a decent distance from my tower. I wondered if any other towers would be able to see the smoke. Would they investigate? Or perhaps were they able to see what I had done? A lone light in the dark isn't hard to spot. Turning around and looking through the tree branches, I could vaguely see the shape of a tower in the distance. I never really gave the other towers much thought beyond contacting them when I needed to. I never knew a tower was so close as that one was. If I was spotted, I would be stopped before I figured out what was going on. I couldn't have my end goal halted like that. Stepping forward, I felt the cool air pressing against my face, almost completely forgetting about the scorched world I was just witnessing. Using the shortcuts I had taught myself, I was able to quickly close the gap between the tower and me. There he was, standing at the bottom of the steps, light reflecting off the dog tag hanging around his neck. I recognized him. Another watcher, far too vigilant through the night. Perhaps he was out here to escape his past as well. My fingers laced tightly around my rifle. Richard stood his ground, a man at arms through and through, but I knew how it would end. That which is meant to be destroyed will always be destroyed. Time could have halted right then and there, and I would have never known. He just stood there, reading me. His eyes were stern and furrowed, one hand on the gate to his tower, the other resting on his hip, rather the firearm that was strapped to it. He was waiting to see what I would do. I tried to remember if I had ever seen him before, rummaging through my memories and I failed to recognize a face that was like his. He was saying something, but I couldn't make out the words or maybe I just wasn't listening to them. My fingers were laced around the rifle, the same one I had used to subdue and kill those kids. He must have seen it. I knew that he knew. I could see the sting in his eye. Those eyes focused on my hands and the small drops of blood revealed by the moonlight. The more we locked eyes, the more his face seemed to shift, memories of the future plaguing my vision. I could see his face twisting into the grotesque visage I had seen just days ago, his clothing tearing up right before my eyes. Then he started shaking, convulsing, and small ink ran down his forehead. When I raised my arms, I couldn't even hear the shot ring out. Regardless, the bullet left my rifle and entered his forehead. I didn't even assume myself that that was a good shot when I got the thing. Lowering my arms, I felt a stinging at my side. Pressing my palm to the sensation, I felt a mutter of liquid. New blood mixed with old and my abdomen leaked. Pulling my hand up, I watched the gloss of liquid coating my palm. Steam seemed to rise from it. I could feel a heat radiating underneath. Behind my hand, I could see Richard's body lying on the ground. He was motionless before me. Flashes of the teens and my family flooded in like flickering flames. Looking up, I could see gray clouds drifting in front of the dark sky. I couldn't just leave Richard there. Helicopters fly over often enough that he would be spotted. The towers are normally kept clear enough of foliage that they can easily be seen. I considered dragging him into the woods, but as that thought crossed my mind, I heard the breaking of branches. They were there again. The small creatures that had attacked me. The ones that started all of it. I could see the sheen from their eyes as they peered from behind the trees and under the brush. They weren't approaching, though. Even with the tower being the only source of light, they stayed in the darkness, nearly motionless from behind them. I could see taller figures. Given just enough light through the tops of the trees, I could just make them out. Their garish figures that I had become far too accustomed to surrounded me, just watching. They didn't intend to leave me. They didn't intend to let me leave either. I had to do what I was meant to do. Walking over and grabbing onto his wrist and pulling up elevated his head from the ground. His body was dragged against the grass until we met the metal steps. The wound in my side ached with every heave. Every step was harder than the last. I kept finding myself having to take breaks. The body would sit with the head rested on the steps, stealing the light metal, pressing his insides into shape. One step after another, Richard was dragged up to his watch. Eventually, we made it up to the cabin. I could feel the sweat soaking into my clothes. 
clinging the fabric to my skin. I couldn't have imagined the wreck I must have appeared in. I thought it would be enough just to pull him into the cabin, but I heard the door behind me after a moment of silence. A few of the burned human visages stood in the doorway. My chest felt tight. Before, they just loomed, watched me, but now they had intent. They were willing to approach me, willing to make me follow through. On Richard's desk was a series of cords and ropes. I couldn't imagine what he might have needed them for. I pulled his body over to the window. I tied the cords around the cabin, trying my best to remember where they were anchored down when I initially saw him. The more ropes placed, the more I felt a strain on my body. Trying to lift Richard's body proved a hefty endeavor. My side and arm both screaming when too much weight was put on them. That sensation gave away to a much more sickening one. A feeling of warm and slimy bark caused my body to shiver and my stomach to lurch. I hadn't seen them so close before, but as their tiny fingers wrapped around my wrist and arms, I turned to see them inches from me. They were pushing my arms up. They weren't helping to lift Richard. They were making me do it. Up close, they resembled the trees less. It almost looked like their skin was made of thick, dark worms. The texture seemed like it was squirming when viewed up close. My body could hardly stand looking at them. The more I observed, the more their bodies vibrated as if they were not supposed to be there. I was too weak to fight them off, though. Too painful to try to do anything other than what I was here to do. Using the force those creatures put on me, I was able to lift Richard's body and secure it. The monsters around me let me go and I watched out the window as the sun began to rise. The horizon looked like it was on fire. Deep and intimidating shades of red and yellow cast over the landscape like a wave of fire. Felt like I was dreaming again. Any moment I could wake up. I could open my eyes and it would be several days back. When none of this ever happened. Where I could just keep my watch. But my watch wasn't necessary anymore. That position had been filled. Staring at the back of Richard's navy green coat, he would be an ever-vigilant watch over the trees. Placing my hand on his back, I could feel a familiar heat rising. Smoke lifted from the gaps between my fingers and soon enough the fabric started to ignite. Flames quickly wrapped his body as if they had been waiting forever to do so. Watching the flames, listening to their crackle, I heard an expulsion of air behind me. Turning around to face it, there was one of these creatures dragging its fingers across a map of the area. They seemed to be unable to speak, so they communicated with me through the written word, though they didn't have anything to say that wasn't expected. I had already seen the words carved by flames the last time. Cleanse us, etched into the wall. Then the thing just walked out, didn't even take the time to look back at me. And then, there it was again. Standing near the charred remains of Richard, observing the destruction that I caused, then it dawned on me. Later, another version of me would make this way to the tower, guided by the dog tags around Richard's neck. I moved around the front of Richard, the flames that wrapped him already burning out. I reached to grab the dog tags. As my fingers clasped the metal and began to pull, this caused pain unlike any other, like all the muscles and ligaments were being stretched through their limits. Needles were poking into my brain, threatening to split my skull in half. I let go of the dog tags and stumbled backward. Even tried to distance myself from Richard, but the pain persisted, and I fell forward. To catch my fall, my hands managed to knock several items onto the floor with me. My body shaking, I looked over where the pain was concentrated. The palm of my hand that had tried to pull the dog tags away, that tried to change the course of events. The skin on my hand was charred and rigid. My heart pounded as I instantly recognized that the raised letters on the dog tag had etched it into my skin. This created dark grooves on my skin that looked like tree bark. Pain ever present, straining attempts to shuffle to my feet. If I passed out in that place, there was no telling what would happen to me. My fist slammed against the ground twice, trying to get myself back to my senses. Shaking arms pulled me from the floor, and weak legs led me out of the cabin door toward the stairs. I took each one carefully, but as I gripped the railing and got a good look at my hand, I could see the pattern from the dog's tag burn was spreading. Foul words spilled from my lips. It was clear what was happening, what I was looking at, and I had no idea how to stop it. With the burn spreading, 
I descended further until my foot slipped on the last step, and I was sent tumbling down the stairs. Whatever pain falling down the stairs would have caused couldn't surface beyond the mind-numbing screech I was feeling. I could see them all watching, but I didn't have it in me to be afraid of them. In a way, I was glad that they were there, that my suffering was not alone. On my knees, there was a retching in me, and loose liquid poured from my lips. A hot, sticky mess sunk into the ground, hot enough that vapor rose from it. I could see the ground becoming singed. I was, however, surprised to see that some of the figures mirrored my motions. The same liquid dripped from the grooves of their faces, burning the sides of the trees and the grass. I must have been too distracted the last time I was here to have seen the damage, or maybe I brushed it off because of a quickly extinguished fire. I couldn't remember. It was hard to recall any memories that weren't bathed in fire. My attempts to plead with the beings to stop harming the area were cut short. Despite the liquid that just poured out, my throat was dry. My words were sliced up and came out as chattering, desperate cries. Gruff and unclear. Still, they stopped. I continued yelling, telling them to leave me alone to go away, and with that, the figures lining the trees backed away and left me to my own devices. Though again... Them being there was a relief. I alternated between crawling and shuffling on my two feet as I slowly got further away from Richard's cabin. Every so often I'd fall over and expel more liquid or rest against a tree, and the pain crawled up my arm. I knew I wasn't where I was supposed to be, that it wasn't my time. It was just not the me that I am. Even my vision before me started to shake as I made my way through the forest. Things that were and things that will be all swam in my head. Not memories or prophecies. I could feel them. When I placed my hand on a tree, it would shift into a flat wall. The same wall in the home I used to live in. I could see the wall, covered in flames. Black smoke, reaching to the ceiling, billowing. I could hear cries from the other room. Shrill reminders of what had happened. Of why I escaped to the forest. Under my feet... The forest floor would shift to the same barren and burned wasteland that I had seen not too long ago. Ahead of me was a pair of trees. My desire to get back to my tower was writhing in me, and I watched the branches of the trees twist and shift. They curved and connected and suddenly a gate stood before me. I found myself stuck in the further on version of the forest as I walked towards the gate. The trees were skinned and naked. Somewhere in the distance beyond the trees the rumbling continued, though... Now I was able to catch small glances of what was causing it. On the horizon, I saw clusters of what I could only assume were distant mountains. But making my way forward and keeping my eye on them, they seemed to also be moving, getting larger. I couldn't help but wonder just how much further in time this place was. As I was watching the mountains, my vision quickly flickered as I walked through the gate and found myself standing at the bottom of my watchtower. It felt comforting to stand down there. I was home again. I climbed the steps, getting used to the pins and needles that caused my skin to flare. A good majority of my body had succumbed to the expanding rot that stemmed from my palm. The feeling of the raised skin compressing together was like squeezing a wet towel, fighting the saturated resistance. It felt disgusting, but it was miles better than the pain that it replaced, like peeling dead skin from sunburn. Finally, making it back up to my cabin, I opened the door and walked towards the window. Looking out at the desecrated landscape, my body wrought with fire and brimstone. The way it was always meant to be. I could see the embers lifting around me, remnants of an eternally burning forest. In the distance, I could see it rising, a line of red dotting the horizon, one that grew higher and higher, and suddenly, I knew where I was. Rather, where I was. Turning, my head slowly... I saw a familiar figure in the chair behind me. There was a fear in his eyes, an uncertainty. He could no doubt see the destruction outside the cabin. So many swimming questions and statements swam through my mind. I couldn't blame him, considering the things he had just witnessed. Raising my hand, I put a finger to my lips, trying to stifle the words that I didn't have the answers to. I could only say the one thing I knew for certain. My words were shaky, but I was getting used to the scratching in my throat. This is all for you, I spoke. My eyes furrowed as they felt the encroaching wave of heat. What was meant to burn 
will always burn, and I felt it all collapsing into me. I never had a choice. I felt my lips move, words I hardly intended to say creeping out. Cleanse us. Hardly a whisper. I wanted to cry it out. I wanted to beg the version of me in the chair, but the flames wrapped around me, and I knew before they could take him, he'd wake up. He'd think it was a dream, something to be forgotten. Then he would make his way to Richard. The flames seared my body, but the heat didn't reach me. Exiting the cabin, I walked down, surprised the heat wasn't warping the metal and pulling it from its foundation. It was meant to be there, though. Meant to watch. The flames rushed by, leaving a saturation of ash and ember in its wake. I could see it continuing through the trees, rushing, feeding off whatever it could until it would wrap around again. Without purpose, I walked through the trees and looked around at all the figures watching me through the trees. My sense of kinship is taking its shape. It was me. It was always meant to be me. Each of those figures a different lingering attempt at escaping the forest. But it would never happen. My problems didn't begin when I entered my watchtower. They began when I left the burning remains of my home and family. When I burned everything that made me, me, to the ground, I would always follow the same path. I wondered how many of me were there. How many of them burned. The small creatures were skittering through the trees around me. I imagined myself being stuck in the heat for years, countless years, slowly shriveling up and becoming numb. No great messiah was bringing an ancient prophecy. Only the most recent version of me, repeating the truths he had learned, aware that escape was not an option. Though I was curious what those things in the distance were, where the deer that attacked me came from, were they one and the same? What was the scope of the world? I could seek them out, and I didn't need to stay put. All the other figures, so many figures had lost autonomy already, just performing the actions their predecessors had to achieve the desired effect. I already played my part. Almost. Again he was behind me, further along in his journey, ready to struggle through the hardest part of it, almost at the end. I hadn't expected him to show so quickly, but the flow of time had stopped being meaningful to me. I spoke the words I remember. They were easy to say, came out like sweet syrup. My vision was flickering as he walked around like I was a shortcut that always led him to just behind me. I figured if he saw me, maybe he'd put the pieces together. As I learned with Richard's name tag, changing things that have already happened is not an option. He spoke to me. It was weird, hearing how my voice used to be, but I played my part. You are here. I finished, realizing the true scope of that statement. Then he was gone. He passed by a tree and his image didn't come out the other side. A world in flames. How many years it'll take I don't know. But that is the fate of all living things. Whether alive or dead, they all burn. Eventually the sun itself will explode in a wave of flames greater than the one I hailed will engulf the earth. It'll take so long, but it's already happened. Maybe that's where I'll go. Seek the next great fire. Starting to walk, I looked around the trees. All the empty versions of me leaned against trees, clinging to the only thing they knew. I looked up at a distant tower, a quick flashing of light catching my eye. An ever-vigilant watcher kept a gaze over the land, a great service. I kept walking. The mountains got bigger. I could see strands rising out of them, like tendrils the deer had. I composited that the deer might have been a parasite to the mountains, or had some mutually beneficial relationship. It took a long time to reach them, years faded into each other, but as I was meant to, I eventually stood at the foot of the roving mountains. Everything was monumentally big. Their steps they took shook the earth beneath me. I half expected the dry ground to crack open beneath me. I stood in awe. Nothing so captivating had ever been before me. Sights that would make everything... Sights that would make everything else meaningless. Standing, feeling wonder fill me. The sky grew bright, the sun encroached upon the earth, and a great wave flushed through the air. I closed my eyes, ready to embrace it all. It was cool, much colder than I expected. The fabric brushed against my own skin. Sitting up, surrounded by night, the chilled air entered my lungs. Looking at the foot of my bed, I could see small, tender hands pulling at the sheet from me. She looked up at me with tears in her eyes, telling me about a bad dream she had. I motioned for her to come into my bed, and her small frame climbed up and fell, right asleep next to me. 
Then, she asked me where Mommy was. I looked over at the long-since-empty spot in the bed beside me and wondered the same thing.